Every Hoosier has a Culligan man, and now for a Numbers are talking at your Hoosier Olds family. Hoosier Hot Rods and Classics is the source for Indiana's going to win it. The Hoosiers are going to win this. People from Florida are called Floridians. People from Maine are called Mainers. People from Washington are called Washingtonians. And people from Indiana are called Hoosiers? On this episode of Talking Hoosier History, we'll explore the history of what is probably the most famous demonym of any state in America. Welcome to Talking Hoosier History, brought to you by the Indiana Historical Bureau. For over a century, we've been marking Hoosier history. Now it's time to start talking Hoosier history. I'm Lindsay Beckley, and I'll be your host for this most literal episode of Talking Hoosier History. One of the most common questions we are asked here at the Indiana Historical Bureau is, what is a Hoosier? And that's usually followed by, where did that word come from? As it turns out, people have been asking just that question for nearly two centuries. Hoosier, spelled in the now ubiquitous H-O-O-S-I-E-R spelling, as well as several other phonetical versions, can be traced back to the American South, where it was used as a derogatory term for uneducated, uncouth people. But just when that word began to be used specifically to refer to people from Indiana is hard to know. According to Indiana University archives, the earliest known written use of the word can be found in a letter dated February 11, 1831. In the letter, written by G. L. Murdoch to John Tipton, Murdoch replied to an advertisement and offered to deliver goods by steamboat to Logansport, Cass County. In closing, he mentioned, Our boat will be named the Indiana Hoosier. The earliest known printed instance of Hoosier appeared in a letter to the editor of the Vincennes Gazette just eight days after the Murdoch letter was penned. In the letter, the author, who identified themselves as Raccoon, noted the increasing population of Indiana, saying, The Hoosier country is coming out, and the day is not far distant, when some states which have hitherto looked upon us as a kind of outlandish, half-civilized race will have to follow in our train. Let the half-horse, half-alligator country look to it. It's pretty obvious by the lack of explanation that the authors of both of those passages expected that their readers would already be familiar with the word Hoosier. So it's safe to assume that the word was in use, at least locally, before 1831. Throughout the early 1830s, usage increased significantly, but it was still mostly found in travelers' accounts and local documents. That changed with the publishing of ex-state representative John Finley's poem, The Hoosier's Nest, in 1833. It's quite a long poem, 155 lines in fact, so we can't recite it all here, but this excerpt should give you a good feel for it. The immigrant is soon located, in Hoosier life initiated, erects a cabin in the woods, wherein he stows his household goods. Ere long the cabin disappears, a spacious mansion next he rears. His fields seem widening by stealth, an index of increasing wealth. And when the hives of Hoosier swarm, to each is given a noble farm. This version of a Hoosier lacks the negative connotations associated with the original usage in the southern United States. Gone is the uneducated, uncouth backcountryman, and he's replaced by an industrious farmer who's moving up in the world. It's likely that the moniker was first used as an insult towards the people from Indiana, but they took it and made it their own, much as colonial Americans had done with the term Yankees in the 1700s. The publishing of The Hoosier's Nest cemented the use of the word on a national scale as it was picked up by other papers and published far and wide. 
And it wasn't long before the first article examining the origins of this most singular term appeared. Just 10 months after the poem was published, the Cincinnati Republican ran a piece simply titled Hoosier. The appellation of Hoosier has been used in many of the Western states for several years to designate, in a good natural way, an inhabitant of our sister state of Indiana. Ex-Governor Ray has lately started a newspaper in Indiana, which he names the Hoosier. Many of our ingenious native philologists have attempted, though very unsatisfactorily, to explain this somewhat singular term. It goes on to list two unsatisfactory explanations of the etymology of the word, before getting to the, quote, real root of the word. The word Hoosier is indebted for its existence to that once numerous and unique, but now extinct class of mortals called the Ohio Boatmen. In its original acceptation, it was equivalent to Ripstaver, Bulger, Ringtail Roarer, and a hundred others, equally expressive, but which have never attained to such a respectable standing as itself. By some caprice which can never be explained, the appellation Hoosier became confined solely to such boatmen as had their homes upon the Indiana shore, and from them it was gradually applied to all the Indianians, who acknowledge it as good-naturedly as the appellation of Yankee. Whatever may have been the original acceptation of Hoosier, this we know, that the people to whom it is now applied are amongst the bravest, most intelligent, most enterprising, most magnanimous, and most democratic of the Great West. And should we ever feel disposed to quit the state in which we are now sojourning, our own noble Ohio, it will be to enroll ourselves as adopted citizens in the land of the Hoosier. Again. This examination totally lacks any negative connotation with the word. Instead, it highlights the virtues of being a Hoosier. The next serious look into the word comes from historian Jacob Pyatt Dunn, who wrote and rewrote his article entitled The Word Hoosier to near perfection. In fact, the monograph that came from his articles, published in 1907, is still seen as one of the most thorough and accurate studies of the topic. It's not often that academic treatises stand up to the test of time like that. So, what did he have to say on the subject? Well, basically, he said that we don't know exactly where we got the word Hoosier, but dismissed many of the existing explanations as utterly ridiculous. He did, however, put forward three options which he thought plausible. First, he theorized that the word migrated up from the South as a slang term used for uncouth countrymen. This is the theory with the most evidence and seems to be the one that Dunn favored. He included a multitude of examples of this usage in the book. Second, he proposed an English root to the word. There are some similar terms found in early English dictionaries, such as hoose, whores, and hoosie, that could conceivably have been corrupted into Hoosier. His third proposal sounds rather improbable on the surface. He conjectured that Hoosier came to America from India by way of England. According to Dunn, the Indian word Hoosier is a respectful form of address to persons of rank or superiority. He admitted that it seems like quite a stretch, but gave some examples of other words, such as khaki, that made the same etymological journey. But as soon as he finished reciting those possibilities, he was quick to assure the reader that he wasn't claiming that these words were definite answers, just that they were possibilities. It is not my purpose to urge that any one of these suggested possibilities of derivation is preferable to the other, or to assert that there may not be other and more rational ones. The one thing he was sure about was that the word existed before it was used to describe a native Indianan Whew, man, as a born and bred Hoosier, it feels downright blasphemous to use that word. Many, many people have discussed, debated, and disputed the true origin of the word Hoosier. In the years since Dunn's 1907 essay, the only work to rival it is Jeffrey Graff's article, The Word Hoosier, written for the Indiana University Libraries. 
He examines Dunn's work, as well as many subsequent scholars who followed in Dunn's footsteps. Graf's 100-plus page article is as thorough as it gets. If you want to pursue all the many various theories about the word Hoosier, you can find a link to his article and all of our sources in the show notes. We could probably have a whole podcast dedicated exclusively to exploring the outlandish Hoosier theories people have come up with. But unfortunately, we don't have time to do that. We do have the time to tell a few of the more colorful origin stories that have come about, though. Frontier Indiana was a rough place that produced rough people. Rough, but strong. I will die with this hammer in my hand. Some of those rough, strong people found that the daily work of cutting down trees, farming, building houses with their hands, and chopping firewood didn't do quite enough to prove their strength to their fellow man. So they fought. They fought at house raisings and log rollings. They fought in the fields and in the woods. Those who were particularly adept at this so-called wrestling were referred to as hushers, for they could quell their opponents into silence. One such husher found himself in New Orleans working as a boatman when he felt the urge to demonstrate his rather remarkable strength. So, he fought not just one, but four men, all at once, and he bested them all. In his enthusiasm, he sprang up, shouting, I'm a husher, but with his accent, it came out sounding more like, I'm a Hoosier. The story goes that this episode was picked up by some of the New Orleans newspapers and that soon, Hoosier came to refer to all boatmen from Indiana and later, all people from Indiana. This next one is my personal favorite theory of how the term Hoosier came into use. In fact, I used this version in a report I did for my fourth grade Indiana history class. It comes to us from the Hoosier poet himself, James Wickham Riley. His version of the story includes the same stereotype of a bunch of rough frontiersmen fond of fighting, as did the Husher theory. These Indiana residents often congregated in taverns to share the news. And maybe a drink or two. My whiskey, my whiskey, my whiskey, I cry. When they got a bit into their cups, they always fell to fighting. And what fights they were, so vicious that participants routinely lost bits of their noses and ears. The morning after these ferocious rows, the barkeep would walk through the barroom and seeing a stray ear on the floor, push it to the side with his foot with a careless, whose ear? If I can't get dry whiskey, Lord, it surely will die. This became so commonplace that it slowly morphed into who's year, and then to who's your. With just 65,000 settlers living in the 23 million acres of Indiana, many people saw the state as a land of opportunity in the early years of statehood. The opportunity to own land, the opportunity to make a decent living, and the opportunity to start over all drew people to the state. Families made their way from all parts of the country to settle on the fertile soil of Indiana. And as they traveled those rough-hewn roads, those families would sometimes come across a lone cabin in the wilderness. Whether they were looking for shelter, company, or both, often they would approach the cabin with a shout of, Who's here? to let the occupants know someone was coming. At this, the door would be opened and the guests welcomed. This scene played out again and again throughout the southern part of the state. Eventually, Who's Here slowly morphed into Who's Ear and later to Hoosier. In the course of time, Hoosier came to describe all people from Indiana. It seems like there's an endless line of explanations, each more amusing than the last, all claiming to be the origin of the word Hoosier. 
And all of these theories have one thing in common. They're almost certainly apocryphal. I mean, the Who's Ear theory was set as a joke by Riley and picked up and repeated so often that people began to think of it as a real possibility. And it doesn't even make sense that you would walk up to someone else's cabin asking who's here. Like, the owner of the cabin is there. Who else would it be? And when you really think about it, how likely is it that one man yelling something that sounded a bit like Hoosier 700 miles away in New Orleans became a nickname for every single person from Indiana? Seems rather improbable to me. Already calling this the game of the century. News people from all over the Middle West are here to witness Hoosier Land's version of the Cinderella story. It's got to work out this time. Now that's it for good. The starting lineup for the Huskers. It's unlikely that we'll ever know for sure exactly where the word Hoosier originated, but from the 1986 film Hoosiers, widely considered to be one of the best sports movies ever made, to the Indiana University Hoosiers, to the 4,500 businesses with the word Hoosier in their names, it's safe to say that it's here to stay. In fact, in January 2017, after a bipartisan effort by Indiana Senators Joe Donnelly and Todd Young, it became official. The U.S. Government Publishing Office updated their style manual and changed the demonym of Indiana so that there are, officially, no Indianans in Indiana, only Hoosiers. Once again, I'm Lindsay Beckley, and this has been Talking Hoosier History. As always, thanks to Jill Weiss Simmons, producer and sound engineer, for bringing her incredible skills to the podcast. And thanks to Justin Clark, the voice of all newspapers here on the podcast. See the sources for this episode and all of our episodes by going to blog.history.in.gov and click on Talking Hoosier History at the top. Keep up with us on Facebook at Talking Hoosier History or on Twitter at, at Talk Hoosier Hist. And if you want to help us grow, subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.